I'll start again. Uh, so the paper is called Freedom and Personal Life. In the everyday, we go on as if there is a thing called freedom. We hold ourselves and others responsible. We feel at times we could have done otherwise. Sometimes we regret things that we have done. It often seems up to us whether we go one way or another. And these all point to what we call freedom. And we feel it is important. But when we try to say what it is, we seem to run into impasses. In a world that's powerfully influenced by science, discussion about freedom tends to go on against a very particular set of background concepts. Say I raise my hand to signal to somebody. Among other things, this is a physical change in the world. And as such, it goes back to other physical changes, movement of muscles and so on. And this seems to be the only way that physical changes can occur. The forces that are in play are understood quite broadly to include phenomena like electromagnetism or gravity, but they have to be part of the broad physical realm, the area that's covered by physics and chemistry. And given this, it seems clear that a physical change has to be explained by other physical changes, and it doesn't look too good for freedom. Some point out that there might be causes of a different sort, like thoughts or deliberations, and that these might be behind the processes that we call free. But if thoughts and deliberations are to cause something physical, <clears throat> they need to incarnate themselves into the physical order. I cannot pick something up with the thought of a hand. The picking up has to be done by something physical, and the physical thing has to be moved in turn by something else that is physical. If thoughts or deliberations get in on the act, it is because they can be reduced in the end to physical things, to neural impulses, and so on. Simon Blackburn says that when I decide to get out of bed, a rather self-important mouthpiece announces a free decision and declares that it is responsible for it. But the action is in fact a sum of neural and other happenings that are quite unknown to the mouthpiece, so that the free decision is really, as Blackburn says, a sum total of systems a combination of numerous unnoticed smaller processes. And he quotes an author who says that he's come to realize he is not an absolute sovereign issuing edicts, but rather a constitutional fiction, a face on the postage stamps, a signature at the bottom of decrees written by unidentified powers, invisible courtiers working in parts of the palace that I have never entered and could never find my way to. If we try to introduce freedom against this sort of conceptual background where the physical is caused by the physical, we seem to need something that breaks with the chains of causality, something that happens without any connection to the physical causes that went before. The main credible concept that seems to cover this in the contemporary discussion is the random. A recent major attempt to defend freedom within a scientific naturalist framework, that of Robert Kane, goes this way. And he tries to introduce something like quantum indeterminacy into an agent's drives to escape a determinist universe. I think most of us hearing this 
probably feel it is not what we mean. There's a further contemporary discussion that assumes the processes of physics and chemistry, but it holds that clusters of processes sometimes develop higher levels and act in a way that is top down so that some of the action in the world is not just a product of the micro levels, but it comes somehow from above. There are two different directions here. Some hold with Kant that the higher level, the free bit, is really just a way of talking that may, helps us to make sense of a complex whole. Kant famously regards biological talk in this way. Others hold that the higher level has a genuine causal force of its own, though one that is in continuity with the microphysical level. Nancy Murphy seems to go this way, and she believes that this sort of um, freedom, uh, this sort of theory, is, is uh, compatible with a certain sort of spirituality uh, and a basic compatibilist freedom. I think that all of these attempts are problematic and I want to approach the question of freedom from a completely different angle. And I'll suggest that the key moment in understanding freedom is the move into personal life, especially the point where we start to speak to another person. And this moment is a good deal stranger than we usually realize perhaps because it is so close to us, assumed in everything that we do, and therefore never quite in focus for us in the way that other things are. An emphasis on the personal relocates the problems rather than solving them. But as we know from life generally, relocation can sometimes be a useful start. So I'll begin with an example of the human animal moving into the personal, the area where I think talk of freedom first makes sense. The example comes from the middle of Dostoevsky's brother's Karamazov, and it concerns an incident in the early life of the elder of the monastery, who's called Zosima. At the time of the incident, he's an officer in the guards, and he holds the attitudes and habits that belong to a guards officer. And he sees the world from this sort of background. Zosima says he looked on the common soldiers as cattle, and that all of the officers did this. And he has the exaggerated notions of honor that are part of this worldview. The story tells how he came to move beyond this. He's attracted by a woman in the society that he frequents, and he thinks that she is attracted to him. When he comes back after a two month absence, he discovers she has married somebody else. And even worse, he learns she was in fact engaged to the other man at the time that he knew her before. And he thinks that everybody knew this except him, and he feels he has been made a fool of. He later recognizes that all these assumptions are false. But at the time, as he says, I was incapable of reflecting and was all eagerness for revenge. So he insults the other man publicly, the woman's husband, and he forces him to a duel. And the night before the duel, he returns home, as he says, in a savage and brutal humor, and he hits his servant, two blows full in the face. He sleeps a while, and he gets up at dawn, a beautiful day, with the birds singing. And he feels very troubled, and he wonders what is troubling him. And suddenly realizes it's what he did to his servant the night before. And he remembers hitting him and the servant keeping his arms down as the text says, his head erect, his eyes fixed on the man hitting him as though on parade. And Zosima says, all at once, the whole truth and its whole light appeared to me. 
what he was going to do, to kill a good man in a duel and to deprive a man's wife of her happiness, the bad wife. And he runs to the servant and kneels down before him and asks forgiveness. This is a Russian novel. <laughs> and the servant is utterly appalled and doesn't know what to say. And Zosima gets up and rushes off to the duel. He faces the first shot, which grazes his cheek. He throws his pistol into the bushes, says, thank God no one has been killed, and asks forgiveness of those present. They are not amused, and they tell him he is disgracing the regiment. He says he's resigning to join a monastery. And finally, they say, that explains every, everything. We can't judge a monk. And they burst out laughing. Now, I want to suggest that the moment where he goes and asks forgiveness of the servant illustrates the move into personal luck, the basic move that lies at the heart of free action. It's a very strange move. And I'll now look more closely at some of its elements with four main comments about it. The first comment is that if we look at Zoisma's world before he asks forgiveness, we can't really find any motive for the action. It's not as though new information comes in during the night that could cause him to change. Everything in his head still encourages him to treat subordinates as cattle and to maintain the honor of the regiment at all costs. It is nothing specific that's intruded that could explain a change. The story suggests a different way of describing what's happened, beginning with the point that the change occurs after Zosima wakes up on a summer's morning. And it's a suggestion that he somehow overall wakes up. The text says the truth now appeared to him in its full light. Waking up has served in the history of ideas as a metaphor for coming into the real world, the one that we share with others. There's a statement attributed to Heraclitus, awake we have a common world, asleep each enters a private world. And within the viewpoint of one who is asleep, there's no motivation to wake up and enter the common world. Even when we hear something like the sound of rain in a dream, our first tendency is to fold it into the dream so that it becomes a further part of the story of the dream. Waking up requires something different, a move to a different level, where we're not simply living the dream, but we're in a position to look back at it as a whole and to say that we were dreaming. The tradition describes this move as reflection, coming to a different level regarding the things that affect us. Once woken up, we see good reasons for waking up. But before we wake up, these reasons are not available to us. So this is a first comment on the story of Zosima, that he's woken up to the real world out of a state in which he thought he was seeing the world, but he was really living in a kind of dream. The second comment is that if we compare his asking forgiveness with any of the actions of his previous life, the asking forgiveness strikes us as free, while his other actions are not free by contrast. The other actions seem to come out of a causal nexus where he's just moved around by the um, constraints of being a guards officer. And this has the striking implication that the original free action, the consent to wake up, is always good and free. And that bad actions have not really managed to become free. So a bad choice is not just a choice for something bad, but it is as if it is itself deficient as a choice. While it regards itself as free, it isn't really. Now, there's obvious problems with this. We know of evil actions that are perfectly planned and executed and which don't seem deficient as actions at all. 
then we blame people for bad actions, showing that we see them as in some way responsible for what they've done, as if they were free when they did it. These questions obviously need to be addressed, but there is a weighty authority in favour of this second comment that only the good action is free, namely that St Paul seems to refer it, that either we are good and free or we are slaves and not really free. The third comment on Zosima's action is that while we feel his action is free, or at least that it brings him into the realm of freedom, in a sense, he's carried along almost as though he cannot do otherwise. And we all have experience of this. A needy person comes in front of me in such a way that I feel I cannot ignore them. I suppose I can ignore them if I set my face to it and work very hard to keep them out. But this would go against the basic thrust of things. If I just let myself go, I'm carried along and I wake up in the personal. The beatific vision in heaven might be like this. We can't stop ourselves enjoying, loving, affirming the vision of God when we're in face of it so that we feel we have no alternative. And yet we are never so free at that moment. Perhaps the converse also applies that if we shut ourselves off from this and hold ourselves outside it, we have a definition of hell. There's a scene in the last of the Narnia books where Aslan has won the victory and returned, um, but the dwarves remain skeptical and suspicious, refusing to accept that anything significant has happened, and they reinterpret everything so it just gets folded back into their old unredeemed life. Aslan says of them, they will not let us help them. They have chosen coming instead of belief. Their prison is only in their own minds, yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. My fourth comment is about how Zosima's move relates to what it means to exist. His asking forgiveness allows the servant to exist and be present in a way that he could not be present before. The servant has existed in other people's worlds as part of their projects, but has not been allowed to exist as he really is. When he's finally allowed to exist, he doesn't, of course, know what to do, and he's appalled when his master kneels before him. He's used to being part of the lives of others. He does not know what to do with a life of his own. The overall point is perhaps better seen in a further example. There's a thing called Godwin's Law, which says that as an online discussion goes on, the chances keep rising that someone will introduce Hitler or the Nazis. So I'll save time by bringing in an example from the Second World War. It was told to Thomas Nagel by the British analytic philosopher, Stuart Hampshire about when Hampshire was an intelligence officer with British forces in France after the D-Day landings. And on this particular day, he had to interview a collaborator who was being held by a French resistance group who was thought to have valuable information. The leader of the group told Hampshire before the interview that whatever the man said or didn't say, they were going to shoot him. The first question the man asked Hampshire was, if I tell you what I know, can you give a guarantee that my life will be spared? Hampshire is faced by a choice between lying to the man and perhaps obtaining valuable information or telling him the truth and risking that he will say nothing. And what we notice is that if Hampshire lies and says the man's life will be spared, the man is importantly prevented from properly acting or even appearing in the situation uh, in which he finds himself. He's reduced to being a part of the world that 
Hampshire projects and manages, and he's not being he's not allowed to exist in his own right. Interestingly, it also seems to follow that if Hampshire lies, he is not present in the world either, at least not in any world that he shares with the man. He's like a puppet master in relation to the world of the puppet show, and the puppet master does not show himself within the action of the show. So that's a fourth comment that Zoisuba's move brings himself and the other into a common world where they can exist as persons. And I think this move into the area of the personal is our basic choice, the root of what we call free choice. Now the word free here seems to focus on the point that personal life proceeds from the person who pursues it in a radical way, so that nothing is imposed on them from outside. And that shifts the definition of freedom away from the point that freedom fundamentally means being able to go this way or that, what's sometimes called freedom of indifference. And it focuses rather on a human being's finding the completion that it was meant for in personal life and affirming this. Once the step towards personal life is accepted as basic, there are various different levels at which our more everyday choices play themselves out. Some of these choices just follow from the original move into the personal and are obvious consequences of the original choice. For example, obligations regarding supporting children. But with many other choices, we just hand them over to our drives and inclinations. Much of our buying at the supermarket probably goes on in this way. We buy this and not that, basically because we like it. And there's a third important level, which is where we work on our inclinations and reactions, and we try to focus them so that they will support personal life. And this is working on one's character forming good habits and so on, so that our life is drawn into a unity where our inclinations support goals of personal life. So the suggestion is that there's a single big choice we make or don't make, and that this is the um, core of free choice, and that other choices have some relation to this, either following it directly or not mattering much either way, or being part of an attempt to move our, um, our inclinations themselves towards uh, supporting personal life. I think that an account of freedom along these lines as an aspect of personal life carries conviction often when we consider it. The problem is that once we recall the facts of micro causation at the physical or chemical level, all conviction disappears. And we feel a voice in our heads saying that regardless of how we talk in the everyday, in the end, it must be just swarms of particles moved around by other swarms. And for the rest of this paper, I'll ask how the personal view sits to the organic underpinnings of choice, the fact that neurons have to fire and so on, if anything else is to happen. And I'll focus on one implication of the microphysical determinist view, which is that it denies the agency of organic holes in the world. And this has been pointed out uh, recently by the philosopher Helen Stewart, who insists that if this is where microphysical determinism leads, it can't be right. And I think this discussion also shows two important further points about the relation of personal freedom to its organic underpinnings. So I'll begin with a couple of contrasting examples from Helen Stewart, where she compares descriptions of the behavior of some fragments of potassium on the one side with descriptions of the behavior of a dog on the other side. If we put some fragments of potassium in water, they zip around on the surface, catch a light, transform themselves chemically, and eventually settle into a new stable configuration. And we have no trouble seeing this whole event in all its detail 
is determined by the initial states and positions of the materials, along with the laws that govern their behavior. So the precise trajectory of the movements follows inevitably from the size and shape of the pieces, where they hit the surface, the angle at which they hit the surface, the temperature of the water, the shape of the containing beaker, et cetera, et cetera. So that as Stuart says, if we knew all these variables, we might be able to say where precisely the potassium would go. And this is to say that given the initial state and the way the world works, uh, what then happens has to happen so that there can only be one outcome and there's no flexibility. Stewart's way of expressing this is to say that at the time of the interaction, nothing is left to be settled by the potassium. She means that potassium does not take the situation a hand in any way, so as to settle it one way or another. What happens just happens to it, so that there's nothing it itself really does. And Stewart then compares that with the case of a hungry dog presented with a dish of tempting food. And while we can predict that the dog will eat the food, she insists that the detail of the activity is not settled in the same way. How fast the dog eats, how often it chews each mouthful, which bit it eats first. All these things, she says, are settled by the dog itself. And they're not settled years in advance by circumstances and the laws of nature. In some ways, Stewart's argument is not very good. A naturalist and determinist would just insist that if we knew enough about what caused the dog to have the character that it does, and we knew its exact neural makeup and so on, and all of the starting circumstances, we could in fact predict all the details uh, of the event with the dog. But the conceptual distinction that Stewart is trying to establish is very significant. She points out that if we hold to microphysical determinism and regard the movement of the dog as if it were just like the movement of the piece of potassium, the dog disappears altogether as an agent. She says, this picture transforms the dog from a being with agency into a mere machine, essentially a mere place in which various inevitable interactions occur. Instead of an agent doing things or settling things, we now have what she calls a kind of epiphenomenon arising out of the hive of activity taking place in the cells, muscles, blood vessels, etc. And if it is this way, there's no agent and there's no agency except as a name we give to a collection of micro happenings. So the, now the older philosophical tradition would have thought that it's not really there as such anymore. And we can see this in the case of a human where the person who acts as if he or she was just a collection of drives and who gives up on the human task of settling things through human activity. A philosophy teacher of mine was once visiting a family in the old East Germany, the Socialist Republic, and he got talking to the son of the family, who was a boy about 10 or so, and he asked the boy what sort of person he admired, who did he think was a figure worth imitating, and the boy replied, in church it's Jesus, in school it's Lenin, and this is the answer of someone to whom things are happening, but who has not really taken anything in hand so as to settle it, and who is just like a piece of potassium zipping around on the top of the, uh, on the, top of the water. And in an important sense, he's not really there. What he calls his life is a collection of happenings that occur to, according to causal law in a particular space that is really just a location occupied successively by different forces, a mere place in which various inevitable interactions occur. 
is Stuart Putzer. And I think that this shows something about what it means to be an entity exercising existence. It's not enough to be pieces in space, even pieces that hang together to make a swarm that has an effect on things around it, like a waterfall or an eruption, something that needs the eye of an observer to make it into a whole. Something first becomes an entity when it takes itself up in some way so that it's trying to become something. A dog or a cat or a human exists as taking itself in hand, heading towards a certain kind of life. And it becomes something by trying to be something so that it doesn't just say whatever to the future, like the boy in East Germany. And even a cat or a dog grasps itself as a whole that has certain interests, sets out to achieve them and complete itself. And it is this that constitutes it as something and takes it beyond just a collection of materials. And this means that it starts to grasp itself as a whole. And it has at least the beginnings of a kind of reflection on itself, and that's what stops it from being just a swarm. Now, the suggestion is that the human does this reflexive move in a very complete way. Zoisima takes up a relation to all of the drives that hold him in their grip, so that in some sense, he's outside them and beyond them. Now, whether a person really moves outside all of their drives like this, at, at least in the shadowy way in principle, is a point of great controversy. Some maintain that what really happens in Zosina's case is that one set of drives, those that belong to an officer in the Russian guards, starts to conflict with a better set of drives that he's picked up from somewhere else, and the better set of drives eventually wins. Robert Kane describes a conflict between two recurrent and connected neural networks where one eventually prevails over the other. Now, Kane still wants to defend a reasonably strong notion of freedom, but most who hold to this sort of model would just settle for compatibilism and say that freedom just means that the network that wins is internal to us and not imposed from outside. And this view would see humans as not too different from cats and dogs, who also prioritize some of their interests over others in particular situations. I think this is not right, and that the strangeness of human life is best described by seeing the human is able to take up a relation to all its life drives in its organic life, so that the reflection is, is somehow complete, at least in principle. When I make the personal move and talk to another person, what I say is guided overall by what I know they will understand if I use certain words. So that in a sense, I take over their point of view and I situate myself in a place where I look back at the whole of me, seeing myself as being an object to the other and therefore taking up the relation to the whole of myself as though I was outside myself with the other. And all of the thoughts and feelings and inclinations that are my starting point are somehow relativized here. And I come and I, I can then come to the other as other and not just an object caught in the projections of my interests. I can do something like this even with an animal. I see a mouse, first of all, as a nuisance that I want to be rid of, but I then realize that it is my interests and their projections that are controlling that view. Interests in having a clean house and keeping my cheese safe and so on. So that the mouse is a nuisance only for the projection of these interests. And once I realize this, I can become aware of the thing as existing beyond my interests, a vulnerable little creature 
concerned with feeding its family and so on, something that I could perhaps make friends with in a sort of way. And exchanges between persons complete this movement at the highest level. So while the human degree of reflection goes on at the highest level, uh, at the highest possibility of reflection, it's nonetheless in continuity with the beginnings of a basic reflection that characterizes all of life. And my final comment is that this suggests an answer to the troubling question about whether freedom implies a break in the microphysical order, some kind of gap in the causal chain. I think that there is a gap, but it's not the one that's usually described. The gap is between a view that sees a seamless continuity of particles and causal relation to one another on the one side and acting holes that exist as holes, things like cats and dogs and humans, um, which exist and do things as holes. And if I see the world in a micro physical way, just as particles influencing one another, I will say that everything happens because of something else that's physical. My arm rises because my muscles move and they move because other things like them move. So that if you're going to posit freedom, you have to assert something like an arm rising without any muscles moving it. But if you take the idea of acting holes seriously, you put it the other way around so that you are an organic thing that's raising its arm and the acting whole in some sense makes the parts do what they do and I think that this is a real break with micro determinism it does not imply some uh, that some uncaused force inserts itself into the micro causal order rather it says that there are acting holes that are not just products of micro happenings so the micro happenings sometimes occur because the whole is doing something. Now, this is very mysterious, and I think it deserves more reflection than it gets. All things exist in as much as at least at a very low level, they're trying to settle something in some way to complete themselves in a particular direction. The human does this at the highest level, one that involves a full reflection bringing the personal into existence, where in a sense, life proceeds completely out of itself. And the actions that bring this into existence and complete, and complete it are actions that we call free. And with this deceptively simple summary, um, having not really settled any of the um, major questions that arise from such a view, I will come to a close. <laughs>